Many folks throughout the Whitetails Range hunt where the habitat has been severely degraded. It's been degraded so long that some think that's how the habitat appeared when the early settlers first saw it. Lighten up the top side of about a 50 acre burn. Make sure our radios are on. So we've got a good black buffer. I set a head fire down there, I'm on top now. Historically, repeated fires created a rich and diverse habitat that was great for wildlife. But as we settled the area, wildfire became less frequent, the habitat changed significantly. Past forestry and land management practices have changed habitats and soils. For example, many of the south-facing slopes here in the Ozark Mountains look drastically different than the early explorers reported. Several of the south-facing slopes here were called balds because they were dominated by native grasses and forbs, and trees were relatively sparse. It was a savanna-type habitat. South-facing slopes tend to be much drier than north-facing slopes, even on the same ridge. And that's because the south-facing slopes receive much more direct sunlight, evaporating the moisture from the area. Through time, several species of grasses and forbs have adapted for these drier conditions and even flourish on the south-facing slopes. These native species are both beautiful and productive. Researchers believe that wildfire would commonly rush up the south-facing slopes and then creep down the north-facing slopes. If they made it through the valley, rush up the next south-facing slope. When Tracy and I purchased the Proving Ground several years ago, all the south-facing slopes were full of eastern red cedar. There was very little sunlight reaching the forest floor. Eastern red cedar is poor habitat for most species of wildlife compared to the native grasses and forbs that were originally found on those slopes. Looking at a 2004 satellite image on Google Earth of an area we called a 50-acre glade tells the story. At that time, it was almost totally full of eastern red cedar. There was no cover from zero to three feet when I walked through there and almost no food for most species of wildlife. Knowing this area could be much more productive for wildlife, I hired a chainsaw crew to fell all the cedars in the 50-acre glade. I gave them instructions to fell all the cedars, but leave the productive oaks standing. After the chainsaw crew finished, we left the cedars laying in place for more than a year to allow them to dry. Then we reintroduced fire into the area to convert it to productive habitat. That first prescribed fire was big and hot. Imagine burning thousands of dried Christmas trees laying over a 50 acre area. Through the years, we've burned that area several times. And each time it was easier because there was less fuel, making it safer and faster. When you check out the current satellite image on Google Earth, you can tell it's changed from an unproductive habitat to a beautiful savanna habitat with a lots of open land for native grasses and forbs and productive oaks still standing. It's important to note that almost all the oaks on that south-facing slope are a native species locally called chestnut oak. It has a much thicker bark than most oaks and is much more fire resistant. I gotta tell you, a standard white oak out there with the thin bark probably wouldn't have survived that first intense fire with all the fuel from the cedars. We waited to ensure there was enough fuel to carry a fire to once again burn this area. And we decided last week was the time. Several days before we wished to burn, Tyler and the interns went and made a fire break around the entire 50 acre area. There's an O2 track running on top the ridge. So the guy started by blowing all the leaves out of that two track and use that as a fire break. They then again used backpack blowers along with the occasional need for a chainsaw and a weed eater to create a break down the western side from the ridge top to a creek. Where the creek wasn't wide enough, they used backpack blowers again to create a break all the way down the southern side, tying in to the first trail. 
While the guys were preparing a fire line, they caught a few ticks and Miss Tracy's been getting a couple of ticks while shed hunting. So the day before the fire, the guys laid out all our fire clothes and treated them with permethrin to repel ticks. The forecast for the next day showed excellent conditions for prescribed fire. I used the National Weather Service because they include several fire indices on their forecast. We loaded up the Yamahas early that morning and headed to the area we'd prepared to do a fire. While rolling through the proving grounds to the 50 acre area, I noticed frost in the bottoms and it was cold and humid. But I knew on that ridge top, south facing slope, it would be much warmer and drier. Growing deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Reconyx, Trophy Rock, Eagle Seed, Nikon, Winchester, Lacrosse Footwear, Flatwood Natives, Morel Targets, Caldwell Shooting Supplies, Hooks Custom Calls, Montana Decoy, Summit Tree Stands, Drake Non-Typical Clothing, RTP Outdoors, Yamaha, Fourth Arrow, Scent Crusher, Mossy Oak Properties of the Heartland, Motorola Lighting Solutions, Scorpion Venom Archery, Code Blue, Decode, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. March 22nd, we're all set to do the first prescribed fire of 2019 here at the Proving Grounds. Conditions are excellent today. We've got pretty good transport wind, which means our smoke is gonna go up and blow out, not just set in the area. Humidity's gonna get low, gosh, might dip below 30%, and I expect it will on the south-facing slope where we're burning. I'm excited about this burn, wanna get started soon. Cool thing about it, it's Owen and Ricky, two of our interns, first prescribed fire. So, gonna be able to get some great habitat work done, as well as share a little education about habitat management. Got the tools we need today. Got to have great transportation. This fire is almost a mile long. We've got the blowers. The backpack blowers are how we made the line. The line's already made, but we may have a slight jump or something and need to make more line. Of course, we got the drip torches. That's how we ignite the fire. We've got a chainsaw in case a snag catches on fire. We don't want that getting up here where it can blow a spark across our fire line, so we're cut it down. All the tools are ready to go. I've got a really important tool here. I use a little kestrel. It allows me to see wind speed, humidity. That's one of the most important things I watch throughout the day to monitor the conditions. If the humidity gets really low, we won't set quite as aggressive of head fire. It's critical to be hydrated. We're already hydrated and we need to stay that way throughout the day. Once you start getting dehydrated, you don't perform as well and you may not be making as good of decisions. That's a huge safety issue. I tell my guys, not trying to be crude, make sure your urine is clear throughout the day. If it starts getting a big color to it, you're not drinking enough water, your performance is gonna go down and you could be at risk of getting in trouble. Our plan for this burn included lighting the top along the trail I discussed earlier, allowing that fire to back into the area about 20 or 30 yards creating a black area, a much larger fire break than just a trail the guys had blown the leaves out of earlier. Once we completed blacking out the top of the fire, we'd work our way down the west, lighting slowly, seeing how the fire behaved, reach the bottom, and then go all the way to the east, allowing a head fire to burn up through the unit. That head fire would hit the large area on top of the ridge we'd already blacked out and simply put itself out. A head fire typically burns about 16 times faster uphill than a backing fire does downhill. That's because the heat of the fire is preheating the fuel and it's ready to burn as soon as it ignites. All right, so we're just, you know, what I do is just start a blower up at the start just to make sure everything's good, working, everything we know is already full. And I'll get my torch ready. And today, as that humidity really drops, if, if I give you a torch for a little experience, you don't have to stream a line of fuel. It's gonna spread really easily once that humidity gets down. You just make a spot, it will grow. So, you got any questions? You okay? Everybody feel good? You're hydrated? Before you go, get a bottle of water in your pocket. Let's all make sure our radios are on. I'm gonna turn mine on. Let's all use channel one today. With all our safety systems in place, I grabbed a torch and started lighting. I always prefer to light a small area and watch the fire's behavior. 
Even though we knew the weather forecast, there's nothing like seeing how fire will behave on a specific site. You can tell it's pretty calm right now. Let's just see what happens. So we can see our wind is going the way it's supposed to. Now, later in the day, that will spread much quicker. We still got quite a bit of humidity. And you gotta remember these leaves are porous that sucked up humidity all night long. Now sun gets up higher, with a little bit of shade here, starts baking that out, it will be going much more aggressive. And typical of the Ozarks, I mean the smoke was going that way, now it's going this way. That's like hunting here, folks. So we just, if we were hunting here, our scent just went from there to there in a matter of a couple of minutes. Now you can see it's going back this way. Once we get it going, we we'll light my torch here. I'll get a little fuel on my wick. Wick's in here. And it takes a while to get going good. And then I can string fire like that. Fire conditions can change rapidly, so I'm constantly watching how the fire behaves, where the flames are going, and even where the smoke is going. I took off lighting along the top of the ridge to the west while Daniel started working east. Lighting up the top side of about a 50 acre burn. We're on the ridge top. We get this blacked out, work around, then set a head fire on the bottom. By that time, we're at 50 yards or so of black area, which is a great fire line, doing a big job to improve the habitat here today at the Proving Ground. So things are pretty black up here on top. It's backed out into the glade. We got a black line, about 20, 30 yards. Grant's heading down the west end. He's starting to light it, because we're black up top. There's no fuel up here for that fire to come up and get up on top. So he's lighting, and things are starting to get hot. On the fire line, I've been lighting. I'm way down the mountain. It's always hard to tell elevation from a flat camera like this. I'm half a mile or less from where we started. Fire is working perfectly. There's just enough breeze going the right direction up the hill. What's interesting is that the wind is actually going this way because the thermals I'm taking advantage of this morning, it's rising up off the line. Fortunately, the humidity was low enough this morning that I could get ahead of it, let the fire go off the line before the wind wants to push it back this way. So. I'm getting a lot of black line, taking advantage of the conditions, letting one go. So I'm about 20 yards off the fire line, but we kind of got a small hill right here through the hardwoods. So what I did was I came through and I lit right on the top of this ridge. If I would have stepped down into the burn unit and started lighting, it would have ripped up the hill come up over the hill and it could have gotten hot and out of control pretty fast. If I would have started at the at the fire line, it would have ripped up this hill, gotten hot, and possibly damaged some of these larger oaks in this area. So by just starting at the top of this little ridge, letting it back down into the bedding area, and then back down over the hill towards the actual fire line, we're saving our saving our oaks and we're blacking out at the same time. Even though the wind was fairly constant, the team was constantly walking back and forth in the area where we'd already set fire to make sure an amber hadn't blown across the line and set a fire outside the area we wished to burn. One of y'all worked up to your feet, Tyler. One thing that we always want to do on these fire lines we want to have radios. We don't want to depend on our cell phones. We got these mountains, service is spotty, batteries die, you know, a lot of things can happen. So we want a good quality radio so we can quickly just hit the button, talk to someone, communicate what's going on. Communication is key on these fires. So we've all got radios. We're all talking, letting everyone know what's going on, what we're seeing and hopefully we'll have a safe burn. I 
I get a lot of questions why we burn, and there are many great reasons, but here's just one. There's a little, oh, a little pile of four inch oak branches right there, they're dead. But it would rot really slowly or decompose really slowly here on this south facing slope. It's really dry like a desert. So by burning, all the minerals are just gonna be deposited right there. Now it's not many, wood doesn't have a lot of minerals in it, but take two or three sticks like that and we're looking at a foot square of land. Well, that's a lot of minerals to shoot some grasses or forbs up. We're just releasing what plants have taken out of ground for years and depositing on the soil with the fire. As you can see, we've blacked out from the timber all the way into the glade. So we've got a good black buffer, no fuel going up to the top of the hill here. So once we're black all the way up top on the ridge, Grant's going to start down at the bottom. He's going to start lighting it and we're just going to ring it around. It's going to be a really hot, intense fire coming up the hill and going to be doing a lot of great habitat work for us. Well, I'm standing out in the bedding area and you can see back behind me, there's just a thick wall right there of hardwood saplings. Those hardwood saplings, they used to have leaves and they were shading out the ground. Flatwood natives came in, used herbicide, treated them, the leaves fell off, they're dead, and it is just fine fuel for this fire. But now we've got native grasses and forbs coming up. We're gonna knock all this back with the fire and have early succession growth, which is gonna be great habitat and food for wildlife. The creek bottom down below me is the bottom line. I set a head fire down there, I'm on top now, and this is all burned out up here. So we got a black line on top. You can see the fire coming up the slope down there, about 150, 200 yards. It's Perfect for savanna type habitat. Burning that native grass, singeing the cedars, probably won't kill them. We we'll have to do that with the chainsaw and not hurting those oaks. Walking through the fire, checking, seeing how things are burning. Came across this area, we've got these oaks. It's wide open underneath, fire came through, and did exactly what it's supposed to do. Can you just imagine how beautiful and productive this area is gonna be here in just a few weeks when we start getting spring green up? This is just an absolute perfect example of the savannas type habitat we're going for and this native habitat that once dominated these south facing slopes here in the Ozarks. I'm just thrilled when I see this. Slow in to a long day, not a bad day, but I'm down here in a little corner and I got a little fire going, eating out just maybe 10 more yards. You gotta stay with the whole fire, folks, because Fire is never satisfied. It's like King Solomon wrote, it's never satisfied. So it will keep eating and eating through there. Now, I've got a road right here and a creek right over here, but I'm gonna stay with it until it gets all the way out. During some of the first burns when there was a lot of woody fuel on this site, it would take us into the night to complete the fire but through successive prescribed fires, we've removed a lot of that large woody fuel and we were able to safely finish by early afternoon and there wasn't one spot over, not one area where the fire crossed our line. An important safety step is to return to the fire the next day and make sure everything's out and nothing jumped the line during the night. Okay, Owen, Ricky and I are checking the fire line. The wind's gonna gust at 20 miles an hour today. 
We've got a fire break over here about 10 yards and just a little bit of flame. An old log has carried flame all night. So we're gonna put this out because a 20 mile an hour wind, we don't wanna take any chance it got over into the unburned area. So we're gonna get that in the black area or be safe. Checking out the burn we did yesterday. It's cold, which means no hot spots. Looks really good. But you see all these saplings here, just gads of saplings. And they're almost all dead because flatwood natives come in here and treated herbicide, uh, used a herbicide to kill all these. So we had burned this, what's important, three or four times before, and we're not able to get it hot enough to kill these saplings. So it was necessary to use one herbicide treatment that will last my lifetime take out the saplings, but obviously did not damage thousands of mature trees in this area. So really great strategy for improving this habitat. We're done. We don't have to disturb the soil anymore with the herbicide. We use fire every three to five years. This place will be green. I'll come back here. This place will be green as a gourd after we get a good rain, some warmer days, and tremendous forage for deer, turkey, and a lot of non-game species. These acorn trees don't have much competition, so they produce a lot of acorns. This is classical savanna habitat, and it is rich habitat for wildlife. As we were walking the line, we heard a tom fire off not too far from the burn. We sat down to enjoy this, and he gobbled several times. Turkeys are very attracted to recent burns. It uncovers all the duff and makes bugs, salamanders, and even new plants available for easy feeding. Hearing that tom fire off was a great reminder of why we do this type of habitat improvement work. Another blessing was later that afternoon and evening, it come a gentle rain. Just enough to put out any residual flames inside of logs we may have missed and cause those native seeds in the soil to germinate quickly. I'm confident in the next couple days, there'll be a lot of grasses and tender forbs sticking up throughout the burn. This will provide great quality food for wildlife during a critical period of time, the last of this winter, and in a few weeks, it'll be tall enough for good quality turkey nesting habitat. I always enjoy returning to the burns to see how the forage is progressing, and we'll keep you updated, hopefully, to encourage you to use prescribed fire where appropriate. If you would like to see how the forage responds to this prescribed fire or our turkey hunting techniques, please subscribe to the Growing Deer channel. I hope you get to experience the benefits and joys of working with habitat. But even if you don't, I hope you take time frequently just to get outside, walk around, and enjoy creation, and daily to slow down, be quiet, and listen to what the creator is saying to you. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.